All right, our next speaker is the editorial vice president of the Ludwig von Mises Institute. Um, that just scratches the surface of, of what he does day in and day out for the Institute. However, um, he is uh, seemingly on the job 24-7, 365, uh, keeping uh, Mises or going and uh, the inspiration of so much of, of what we do at the Institute. He's, a, uh, of course, a frequent writer for Mises Org. Uh, he's been a frequent writer for LouRockwell.com. He writes a column for The Wanderer. And, of course, he's the author of a, a book uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with called Sing Like a Catholic. <laughs> or not. But he's got a new book coming out. And I wish we had it today to sell, but we don't. But we're going to have it very, very soon. Please look for it. It's going to be called Bourbon for Breakfast, <laughs> Living Outside the Statist Quo. It's a clever title. He's a clever speaker. He's going to talk today about the cultural upheaval of loose money. Please help me welcome Mr. Jeffrey A. Tucker. I always appreciate Doug's introductions. Interesting. OK. Well, every time I'm asked to talk about money, of course, I'm sure it occurs to you also, you want to sing the Monty Python money song, right? Yeah. yeah. So I printed out the words just in case I was inspired to do that. And I feel a vague inspiration. So I've got 90,000 pounds in my pajamas. I've got 40,000 French francs in my fridge. I've got lots of lovely lira. Now the Deutschmark's getting dearer. And my dollar bills would buy the Brooklyn Bridge. There is nothing quite as wonderful as money. There is nothing quite as beautiful as cash. Some people say it's folly, but I'd rather have the lolly. With money, you can make a splash. So, I'll skip to the end. I'll skip to the end. <laughs> Everyone must hanker for the butchness of a banker. It's accountancy that makes the world go round. You can keep your Marxist ways, for it's only just a phase. It's money that makes the world go round. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a wonderful children's song. You know, teach that to the kids, raise them upright, you know. Um, so what, what, is the, what, is the, what is the core of truth to the song? Um, I like the phrase, it's accountancy that makes the world go round, because it illustrates something about the case that Mises made concerning money, that it allows us to calculate profit and loss, and it's the calculation of profit and loss that gives us the tools to build up an economic structure and ultimately civilization. Um, it amuses me that even now, you know, you'll, you'll be bumping into some campus uh, socialist, and they say, well, you know, the real problem is we just need to get rid of money. I mean, if we just get rid of money, everything, everything would go away. I mean, inequality, you know, injustice, all the uh, capitalist exploitation. Uh, it's a remarkable claim because without money, of course, we're back to uh, barter. And in a state of barter, you can't do a darn thing. We're all reduced uh, essentially to hunter-gatherer state. And uh, it was Mises' great contribution um, in 1912 in his book, The Theory of Money and Credit, which I notice we have brought with us now, 1912. Uh, so almost 100 years ago, he spelled out a, 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 this marvelous treatise. He explained the origin of money, its function. Um, in this, he was drawing from Karl Menger, uh, who was really the first to fully explain, mm, I should say probably in modern times, that money isn't something that is imposed upon us by the state or given to us by any particular rulers. And it didn't come about through a consensus. For example, we can't all just in this room decide that um, we're going to make a new currency out of this, this, this Hilton meeting notes sheet or something like that. It doesn't work that way. Money originates through market exchange. It's a, it's a real commodity that's demanded in the market that eventually over time, uh, comes to be seen as the most reliable um, for acquisition in order that you can use it to buy other things, other goods and services. So Mises, very patiently in this like 400-page treatise or something, explains 
uh, how we move from an economy of barter to an, an economy of monetary exchange, an economy of direct exchange to an economy of indirect exchange, and that permits economic calculation, uh, permits accountancy, you could say, and therefore the building of, of capital and the building of, of production structures that stretch over long periods of time. Uh, so you can begin to make sense out of the world. That's the, that's the purpose of, of money. Mises' unique contribution in this book was to explain the initial value of money. Where does that come from? And in a, in a, uh, in a logical uh, derivation that's since been called something like the regression theorem, uh, he explained that the value of money initially comes from its value as a commodity. And one of the features of money is that it's, it's stable, it has a high value uh, per unit of weight, it's durable, so it lasts over time, so you can really, it, it becomes a source of security for you. You know, like something really dependable. In some ways, the most dependable thing, because you acquire it, it's the most demanded good. You acquire it because you're, you're sure it's going to be worth something in the future. And it can make your dreams come true in the future, whatever they happen to be. But what happens in a world in which that is no longer true? Uh, when money doesn't make the world go round anymore, when you can't depend on it, it's no longer your source of security, um, and instead becomes worthless. It be, it, it, it's demonetized. Uh, that's when, I think we could say, the world turns upside down. And history provides us many examples of this, many intriguing examples that begin to fascinate you once you study them. Tom DiLorenzo mentioned uh, the case of uh, the hyperinflation of the continental, the hyperinflation of the Civil War. These are um, the way war and inflation is connected. These are destabilizing events that turn society upside down. You wonder why it is that anybody would fall into this, into this policy of inflationism. You know, we've learned again and again and again, I mean, since the ancient world, that, this is, that, that inflation is folly, and, and yet we keep doing it. And, and I don't think it's just merely because it has some advantages for the government or for, for some producers or for debtors or whatever. It's also because some people actually favor that. They favor the way inflation creates a kind of social upheaval. And I think that's what I'd like to talk about here a little bit. Well, first, I'd like to quote from Mises' book 100 years ago. Now, keep in mind that the 20th century is the age of central banking. It's the central, it's the, the, the longest period of time in the history of the world where most governments in the world have had central banks uh, that have systematically destroyed currency. And from that fact follows many other things that you can understand about the 20th century that you would not have understood unless you understood this causal relationship. So here he is writing in 1912. Mises warns us about this problem. He says, the arguments, 1912, the arguments urged in favor of centralization, monopolization, and state control of banks of issue in general, and of credit issuing banks in particular, are thoroughly unsound. That's, Mises is great, really clear. During the past 20 or 30 years, the literature of banking has got so thoroughly lost among the details of commercial technique, and has so entirely abandoned the economic point of view, and so completely surrendered itself to the influence of the most undisguised kinds of etatistic argument, by, by which it's a French word, means statist or government-biased uh, argument, uh, that in order to find anything that's correct, anything that's really sound on this question of money and banking, you have to go back to banking literature and policy of two or three generations ago. And Mises was observing this. It was true in America, too, you know. The 19th century was filled with hard money writers. People understood the need of the gold standard, anti-central banking writers like Tom DiLorenzo was talking about. Uh, by 1912, the United States, you could hardly find anybody who was against the Fed. The economists, econ economics establishment had been largely corrupted. So he sums up what's wrong with central banks. He says, their one intent may be summed up in one sentence. By hook or crook, keep the rate of discount down. They have achieved the circumvention of all the natural and le legal obstacles that hinder the reduction of the bank rate below the natural rate of interest. And with this one tool, you can destroy civilization. Seems amazing, doesn't it? But you've got a central bank constantly suppressing an interest rate below its natural rate, everything can unravel in time. And that's, in effect, what's happened in the 20th century. Mises saw it. So Mises favored safeguards, some kind of restriction on, on central banks so that they wouldn't, they wouldn't um, 
They wouldn't inflate. But he said it's not enough. It's not enough to simply restrict the central bank. What we need to do is restrict the ambitions that lead the central bank to do what it does. He says money is part of the mechanism of the free market in a social order based on private property and the means of production. Only where political forces are not antagonistic to private property and the means of production is it possible to work out aiming at the greatest possible stability of the objective exchange value of money. What he means to say is that, look, um, you know, inflation and monetary expansion is, is not just an end in itself. It serves ideological ends. And those ends include like expanding, this, expanding the state, um, <clears throat> uh, favoring uh, debtors, debtors over, over creditors, it, uh, favoring social revolution, funding wars, all these things that are, that are really behind, behind inflationary policy. And Mises says we have to get rid of the ideology uh, that's backing these various policies and inflation is funding before we'll get true stability. I would like to talk uh, today about 10, what I'm, I'm kind of calling 10 cultural effects of, of inflation and uh, kind of enumerate them one by one. And in so doing, we're going to be drawing on the work of Guido Hulsman, Murray Rothbard, uh, many other writers. Uh, Doug French has, has contributed to this literature uh, beautifully. Um, I would like to focus a little bit in particular on, on what happened in Germany uh, during the hyperinflation of the, of the mark in the early 1920s. I think... Um, we, we, we do well to learn something about this because as I was reading about it, I was really spooked about the ways in which that experience seems to have some parallels with our own. Um, and I say this because, you know, this word inflation, it's, it's funny, we think of it as rising prices and probably many of you in the room, every time somebody says the word inflation from this podium, you're thinking, well, it doesn't seem to be that bad, you know? Well, inflation takes many different forms. Uh, the old definition of inflation in the 19th century, when you read a dictionary, it said the expansion of money and credit. Right? It didn't say anything about rising prices. High, rising prices are one of the effects of inflation. Nowadays, people use the word inflation to just mean prices are going up. But if you think of it that way, you'll miss a lot of the underlying dynamic of what happens in an inflationary economy. Um, Essentially, uh, inflation is the expansion of credit and money, uh, the destabilization of the currency, the manipulation of the interest rate, and that can have many unpredictable effects. And it's not like a machine. It's not like the central bank pushes the button and that causes prices to rise over here, and if the prices aren't going up, then everything's safe, you know? I mean, what you have here is essentially the central bank violating natural law. And this, the spillover effects of that can be, can be unpredictable, unpredictably dangerous. Um, after the war in, uh, in Germany, the central bank embarked on a big inflationary policy to pay war reparations and to uh, somehow get out of its debt and all, all these, and, and to build up the regime, which was seriously uh, reduced after the war. Uh, but the effects of it really weren't, weren't obvious at all. Um, even up to 1918, inflation was running, you know, anywhere between one and six. One and six percent, and it was actually lower inflation. The price inflation rate was running, you know, six percent or something. It was actually lower than in many other European countries and the U.S. So nobody had any real reason to worry too much. By by 1923, five years later, the mark had fallen to one trillionth of its value of the previous five years. Um, without any big drastic change in central bank policy. It just persisted. What happened was that the psychology changed and um, people began to act differently. And it was like a forest fire that went out of control. And, um, and by 1923, the whole thing began to unravel. Um, the culture, really, was turned inside out. The old bourgeois values uh, were out the window and new values came along, and the society, entire society just went into upheaval because the money failed, because the money died. Um, and what's interesting to me, especially in reading about this, is that if you lived in the thick of it in 1921, 1922 Germany, 
um, there were rising, there's pauperization going on all over the place. People were getting poor, but many other people were getting richer. And it wasn't entirely obvious to people if society as a whole was, was, was rising in prosperity or falling. It was unclear. Uh, it was just a lot of confusion. Many people were excited. Business was booming, for example, even under hyper, hyperinflation. Um, where people used to have work eight, eight hours a day, you know, now they were starting to work um, 16 hours a day. Everybody went to work. There was a job for everybody. Um, everything, um, uh, the old jobs went away and there were new jobs for every, everybody else and, and everything was highly, highly remunerative. Um, one of the main jobs that, that uh, was available to even the lowest peasants was uh, pushing wheelbarrows of money from place to place, actually, because uh, that's the way you ended up near the end of, of having to carry the currency around. It was, it was a dangerous job in some way, a great deal of security risk, you might think. It's true, there were robbers that would come along and, and steal your wheelbarrow. Of course, they'd leave the money, uh, but uh, <laughs> steal the wheelbarrow. So you, had to, uh, you had to protect it, but it's very strange when this becomes the kind of jobs that are highly remunerative in an economy. Um, many wonderful plays and st stories were written about this ghastly event um, in the years that followed, and it wasn't entirely clear to the typical German um, until after the whole uh, thing happened. It was in the late 1920s, then that's when the writers and, and the playwrights and the short story writers and the pundits began to realize what had happened. It was really after the fact that they looked back and said, oh my God, that was just a disaster that led to... Um, a complete cultural social upheaval will never be the same again after something like that. But it, you see, it wasn't obvious during, during the, in the middle of it. It seemed like business was doing very well. I'm afraid that that's probably going to happen to us, actually, is if we start seeing these kind of things take place. And the other thing is that, that in the middle of this inflation, nobody really understood it was the central bank that was doing it. You know, uh, Everybody blamed everything else. Um, foreign exchange problems, you know, the weather, you know, as, 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 as uh, Doug was claiming about Zimbabwe, but uh, speculators, of course, were the, the, top, the top evil, you know, but the central bank wasn't really part of the equation. It was only after the fact, once, once the intellectuals began to get involved and see what happened, that uh, the public opinion turned against the central bank as being the source of the problem. And people were still blaming the Treaty of Versailles, you know, that's why. And, uh, now, we know what happened in Germany after, after the hyperinflation. Um, the National Socialists took power. And um, what's the connection between hyperinflationism, hyperinflation and the rise of Nazism? Um, this, this writer named Bernd Wittig, Culture and Inflation in Weimar, Germany, he, uh, he has an interesting theory about this. He says, look, if money is this crucial form of communication in society, it's, it's the thing that, that helps enterprises talk to each other. It helps us form our values and shape what we do. Um, and helps us, helps us how to undertake our activities every day. It's the, it's the thing we rely on most that helps us be stable and helps us plan for the future. When that's gone, what do you turn to? The argument of the National Socialists was the merchant class has failed you. The money has failed you. The traders have failed you. Uh, the money lenders, the Jews, have failed you. Look what they've done to you. You can't depend on this system anymore, this, this laissez-faire capitalism. You need something else, something that's really going to last, something that's really true and really stable. And what is that? That is blood. That's the blood of the people, the German people. That's what lasts through the generations. Not this money, not commerce, not laissez-faire. We need order. We need order rooted in blood. That was a persuasive argument, but it was only persuasive because the money failed. Do you see? I think it's an interesting theory. I think he's right. Mises could never fully account for it, I don't think, when he was understanding the relationship between these two things, the Weimar inflation and the rise of, the rise of Hitler. I think, I think this book is right about that. When, when, when the money goes, everything is up in the air, and people are prone to glom on to crazy theories, crazy ideologies, very dangerous movements. You know, so often, 
The effects of inflation are, are, are masked to us. As I was preparing this trip, I, I walked into my, um, into my closet in my, in my home. I thought, well, I need a bag. And you know what airlines are doing to you now, right? With the bag thing, you know, you go and you try to check a bag and they say, oh, well, that'd be $600. What? You know. Um, so, uh, so nobody's carrying bags on airplanes anymore. Well, our values have changed, you know. I mean, even a year ago, I'd travel and with lots of suits and shoes, I don't know, whatever. And, but now, I, I opened up my closet and I saw something like eight sh huge bags that I used to took, take some pride in, you know. And I now I look at them and I think, what was I thinking? Look at these, they're monstrous and terrible. What am I going to ever do with these bags? I just want to hurl them in the trash. So I began to dig around for bags and uh, I couldn't find anything that was small enough to carry just on the plane, you know. So I finally went to my daughter's room, which is 15 years old, knocked on his late. And she gave me this, and I thought, well, you know, leave it to the young. You know, they're always ahead of us, you know, especially in inflationary times. The young are always kind of hip and happening, and we old timers, you know, are stuck on the past or with their big bags. Well, she's got the small bag. So I, I took the bag, and I was feeling kind of, you know, um, on top of the game, you know, wheeling into the air, airplane. And I turned around to the guy next to me, and uh, and uh, I don't know, I just struck up a conversation or something. Well, he had this thing hanging around his neck that was about that big. And I said, so, uh, did you check your bags? He said, oh, no, this is what I've got. This is what I'm carrying. It's about that big. So I suddenly, I suddenly felt like I was behind the times with my... <laughs> That's our future. Now, but how do you trace this to inflation? I mean, how's this related to inflation? Well, the oil prices went up. The airplanes uh, discovered that they wanted to get more value out of, their, out of their, their flights. They're starting to rent out all the baggage spaces to carriers that are willing to pay more. And uh, so there's an opportunity cost every time they pack a bag for us, the opportunity cost of what they would otherwise you know, pack for, the, for, the, uh, for, the, for these, um, for other commercial packaging. So they kick us out. And uh, the profits are squeezed because of the recession, which was caused by the bubble, which was caused by the central bank. Uh, the bailouts allowed them to continue to pay the unions and not cut back where they should cut out. Anyway, all these effects, all these, but this is all hidden stuff. You have to think about it for a long time. Even the terrorist incidents, you know, are probably ultimately blamed by inflation. Why did Bush think he could have that war back in 89 that stirred up every terrorist in the world? Now, you know, with an inflationary policy, you have an unconstrained vision. You know, like, like Thomas Sowell talks about unconstrained vision. Hey, why don't, we have, why don't we have free healthcare for everybody and free drugs for everybody? Yeah, why not? And what's stopping it, you know? Why don't we, you know, there's some bad guys in the world. Don't you think about it, just kind of launch some missiles, missiles at them, kill them, and clean up the, yeah, let's do it. You know, hey, why don't we, why don't we educate every last person and, and so they could we'll just make sure that every, pay for everybody to get a PhD and, um, and also a, a huge home. Yeah, sure, why not? What's stopping it? You know, when you got the printer's press, printing presses running, everything seems possible. It's, it's, it's an unconstrained vision. That's the state you have under a central bank. Let me just list these things. This is what I came up with. Number one, inflation, uh, central bank, funds a vast expansion of government and a loss of individual responsibility. This is, I think, the number one problem. I mean, if you could have inflation, you could deal with the economic effects, but the fact that it's, it, that it's fueling Leviathan and, and expanding the state with this unconstrained vision, extremely dangerous. The crushing of intermediate institutions and the decline of family and other social units. You know, Mises, I, by the way, this is brand new in print. Ludwig Mises on money and inflation, a synthesis of several lectures. And I can tell you when you're reading through these things, he was a different guy when he would lecture as versus when he was writing human actions. He would tell these great stories. But he talks about how all throughout the 19th century in Vienna and um, Austria and Germany and all over Europe, that there were vast foundations that had been established with private money to care for widows and orphans and the poor uh, that were elaborate and, and huge, just like in the United States, um, and that these were all wiped out through the inflation, making society radically vulnerable. So it, what it does, what, it, what inflation does, it, it, takes, it destroys these, the inflationary policy destroys these intermediating institutions, the, the things that stand between us as individuals and the state. You know, I'm talking about churches, civil associations, all these organizations that rely on private funding, the, the leftovers of our production that we don't use for eating and feeding or clothing ourselves. These go to fund, fund these big nonprofit organizations where they get destroyed uh, through inflation. And it made Europe very vulnerable to the state. Um, the, the family issue in the United States is a very interesting one because 
if you look at the data, you go to the women's studies departments, they herald the glories of um, uh, the professionalization of all women, you know, well, wow, you know, the people, women, you know, didn't, didn't used to just get remunerative work, you know, they could just sort of stay at home or whatever. Well, the, the claim it's due to femi feminist ideology and raising of social consciousness, well, I can tend to, if you look at the data very carefully, it was all due to the, the Carter inflation of the 1970s. I mean, that's, that's what changed the structure of the American family, and it's continuing to change because of that. Extends wars and tempts politicians with bad programs that do not work. Tom DeLorenzo talked about that. It cheapens the liabilities for enterprises and punishes real entrepreneurs. You know, uh, during the dot-com bubble and bust, or during the real estate boom and bust, you know, the, the chumps were the old-fashioned entrepreneurs who saved and invested, you know, and, and uh, tried to keep their books clean. Pfft, you know, they got wiped out. I mean, the people who make the big bucks are the ones who take the high risk and take on the li highest liabilities. It subsidizes going into debt for individuals and addiction to credit. Did you know, did you know how bad American addiction to credit was before the before the bust of 2008? I had no idea. I turned on the television, I saw some guy going, yeah, I don't know what's with this car, this car company, you know? I mean, I'm trying to buy a car and they wanted me to put down like $400. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know it had gotten that bad. I mean, it's, it's, it's insane. Um, brings about financial dependency, you know? We live in uh, Auburn, Auburn is a student town. I've never seen anything like it. It teaches the youth how to live in the present. Uh, they become disrespectful to our elders, betrays their camp, they begin to look at everybody older than them. Anybody who has old timey values as, as just a bunch of chumps, you know, they're not with the times. Very dangerous. It brings about a shift in professions toward finance and causes rampant materialism. It happened in Germany, it, ha it happens anywhere you, you see these big bubbles develop. People just glom onto finance, they're making money by trading money and that's it. Um, this is one of my favorite, this is um, number nine. Inspires language and dress to become sloppy. I, I'm sort of a sociologist of these, these kinds of issues of manners and dress. And I, I, you can trace it actually out throughout, through, you can look at the business cycle and compare it with you know, books on what people are wearing. People dress, dress up during recessions and dress down during booms. It's an interesting thing. That's a different lecture though, isn't it? Um, <laughs> My tenth one is the one that Tom already brought up. It turns people against capitalism. And let me just tell you, I think this is the number one dangerous aspect, probably number one most dangerous aspect of inflationism. How many people do you know are blaming the boom boss today on capitalism? They say it's discredited capitalism. This is the number one thing I hear all the time. And I was just the other day in a coffee shop. I had was reading this book and a guy comes up to me and says, a friend of mine, he's from Germany. He was raised in you know, liberally-minded public schools in Germany. He said, oh, culture, inflation in Weimar, Germany. And then he said to me, he said, yeah, Weimar, the last great hurrah of laissez-faire capitalism. And he's looking at me like that. You know, and I'm kind of staring back thinking, do I, do I want to continue reading my book or have a two-hour long argument with this guy? So <laughs> I decided to have a, continue reading the book. But listen. <laughs> He's raised in German public schools, a liberal, progressive public school. He said what Hitler said. You see? This, this, is what, this is what inflation does. It discredits the private property capitalistic order. It needs to be uprooted from a truly free society. A truly free society, as Greenspan, Greenspan once said, should not have a central bank. It should have a money that's a market money. That can be a gold standard. It can be any money that the market chooses. It can be competitive currencies, but it should not be regulated by the central, central planners, the Soviet-style central planners and the central bank, which are going to, will continue to undermine capitalism with everything that they do. In 1944, Mises wrote, all governments are firmly resolved not to relinquish inflation and credit expansion. They have sold their souls to the devil of easy money. Mises was great, wasn't he? Sold their souls to the devil of easy money. And that is, in fact, what we have done in this country, and we will pay the price. But listen, what's the answer? I think the answer we see before us, uh, in the last two years, I have seen more public discussion of issues of the Fed and paper money and the problems of, of credit expansion and even the Austrian business cycle theory than I've seen in my entire life. I never thought I would see anything like it. 
we're living through times that are very much like the 19th century in the sense that people actually debate the topic. They're talking about it for the first time. You know what it's like to work at the Mises Institute and see this kind of stuff happening? Listen, we held a conference in 1982 on the gold standard. Everybody said we were crazy. For all these years, for all these years, 30 years, some of 28 years, we've been putting into print books on this topic when everybody else is ignoring it. Right now, we have in print every important hard money treatise written throughout the whole of the 19th century in America. We have in print all the books of Murray Rothbard on this topic, and Mises and Hayek, if it weren't for the Mises Institute, you would not have a book on Hayek in print right now uh, of all of his major business cycle writings. Everything was in place and ready when this bust happened. And we were there. I mean, how gratifying was that? We've been working for all this dec for decades of people saying, this is stupid. What's your obsession with this topic? Shut up, for God's sake. <laughs> Well, we did the right thing. We did the right thing with your, with, with your help and with many other people who are like you, who helped us through their contributions. It's this kind of education, this kind of public consciousness that's going to change everything. We cannot let the central bankers and the government get away with, it, with blaming speculators, with blaming China, with blaming the weather, all the rest. We need to put the blame exactly where it belongs on the central bank. And the only way to do that is by getting the word out. We've never had a better opportunity than we have right now. Thank you so much for listening.